to tell the next person the same thing. I have to stay uh, somewhat on time with my talk. Um, I, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tony UV, Tony UC Velez. Uh, I'm here to talk about PASTA. PASTA is an acronym for uh, Process for Attack Simulation and Threat Assessment. It's something that uh, me and my co-author uh, from uh, a major international uh, international banking institution um, have come up with after years of kind of looking at what works, what doesn't work in terms of evaluating applications of any type. I'm going to have somewhat of a, there's a couple metaphors here with the culinary aspects just to keep it lighthearted and also there's a, a couple of, um, you know, definitely it's a little bit more web centric so if you're dealing with more traditional client server, more like uh, mid-range apps, mainframe apps, this still is really applicable. Um, so let's go ahead and get the party started. Uh, here's quickly the, the roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, talk a little bit about me. I've got to establish some credibility with you guys in terms of uh, why am I talking about PASTA today? How could you use PASTA as, a, as an application threat modeling methodology? Um, we're going to go into some terminology. There's a lot of terms out there that related to application threat modeling or just threat modeling in general. It's time to level set. It's time to level set on proper uh, and also misuses of terms. Uh, we're going to get the recipe for pasta. I'm gonna, pasta is going to be revealed in a, in a book. It's a trademarked and uh, patented methodology that uh, basically has taken about two and a half years to research and really kind of apply and get the uh, feedback from a lot of different international uh, security leaders and organizations. Um, we're going to go through these phases of pasta. And uh, at the end, we'll culminate with um, uh, basically some uh, what the end goal is for this application threat model. So, meet the chef. All right. Um, basically, I'm really I don't like to speak about myself. You guys can read up here who I am, what I do. I'm just like you guys, a security practitioner. Uh, I don't think view myself a security expert. Never will. I don't care how many years of experience I have. But uh, basically, just some key points here. Uh, I've one of the things that really you know, uh, lends to application threat modeling in general is the diversity of experience. You have to be able to have, be a jack of all trades, but as many of you know, when you're the jack of all trades, you kind of have shallow waters of expertise across different areas, which is dangerous. So you want to be able to build a good amount of depth across different security disciplines. So that's one of the things that I've been in security ops, network ops, IT, development, uh, been in management, um, you know, been in monitoring and did a whole 24-7, 365 role at one point in my life. So it all lends to understanding the different security disciplines and how they come together. Now let's talk about some of the terms here. Now this stuff right here up top is from, if, if how many of you here, I'm sure you've heard of like Microsoft's SDLIT tool, they're, they're, uh, they have another free tool that they have um, that we'll actually show some snippets of later on. They, Microsoft dominates the landscape when it comes to threat modeling. And uh, they, this terminology right here, asset, threat, vulnerability, attack, these are straight from Microsoft's patterns and practices. What I've added here are some actual terms that are, are, are missing. Uh, not, to the, not that they are excluding it deliberately, I'm sure they're not. I know Mark Curfee, I know the guys working in the ACE team, and there's the, those guys are sharp, and they have great products and, and a really good um, uh, threat, model, threat modeling content. But assets, when we're talking about threat modeling, and assets basically, it could be uh, you know, a server, obviously, it could be an a software asset. It could be even an information asset, so basically the actual data within a, 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 an environment. Uh, threat, something bad could happen. Vulnerability, I don't need to explain that. You know, there's a weakness in, involved in the application and the platform and the network, something could be exploited. Countermeasure, you know, for the auditors in the room, which I don't think there is any, but you know, just in case there is, this could be synonymous with control. Here are the things that are not reflected in the Microsoft and Patterns uh, website. It's use case. The great thing about threat modeling is that now you take a step back from security and you get back into your IT roots if you came up from there. Um, you get to understand what functional requirements were defined. What is this app supposed to do? What, why is it, when, what is the impersonation account supposed to accomplish in you know, between one app server and the cluster of databases or you know, you want to understand every single use case within your application environment. Why? So you can defend it better. Because with use cases, you have abuse cases. And abuse cases simply what we security, this functionally oriented security people are out to look for. 
to destroy, to re kind of rehash or circumvent a particular countermeasure in a, in, or abuse the business logic for an application. Attack vector. That simply means channel of attack. How am I going to get it? Is it going to be a form field? Is it going to be a human target? Um, is it going to be, when, I, when we say application, when we say threat modeling, I know entities uh, that do threat modeling, there, there is this, uh, I don't want to uh, say this, that there is this example where there is this a company that does threat modeling, but they're, they're, they're working with the federal government for a Scandinavian country to basically look at the threat model of amendments to their constitution, which is like, whoa, that's, that's kind of crazy. So what is that? What they're trying to derive is what are what are the threats from the amendments being ratified, the outcry, backlash, etc. What uh, the attack vector in application context simply means is the channel of attack. You know, is it a human that's governing access control or the, the, the access to a particular area? Attack surface is a broader area of attack. It's going to have multiple attack vectors. Attack surface might be your mobile platform. It might be actually an, an app store marketplace uh, where it has you know multiple opportunities where you can kind of uh, you know append to maybe uh, different apps that are very popular, not well uh, not well uh, certified or not well authenticated in terms of an actual app. They're just you're relying on the fact that people are buying things and you want to get into that thing so you can be a part of their uh, mobile application environment. An actor is simply a caller. If you've done programming, then you know basically it's who's calling what actions. And it doesn't have to be necessarily in a programmatic sense. It could also be going back to the social engineering aspect. You know who's acting as the attacker in a social engineering red team type of experiment. Impact. I'm sure you guys know what. What is? Why are we doing any of what we do? If you're a pen tester, if you're a source code analyzer, why are we doing it? I mean, yes, we have our decrees from above to say we have to, you know, do this. Compliance is obviously, unfortunately, a driver. But why are we really doing it? And deriving a business impact is what, in my experience, I humbly would recommend that you derive what the impact is so you can make a better manifestation of risk. Uh, we'll get into the whole risk, religion, warfare debate and um, the state of it in a second. A tax tree is simply, you know, we know what sort of, basically if, you, if you've ever done like any sort of like, uh, you know, you, you understand the concept of trees and you have like a, a parent node and then from that you might have branches which might be get, you know, branches which might actually have leaves. Basically you have an asset where you would have, you know, a tax that are a tie, or actually you would have uh, use cases that would be married to you know attacks, possible attacks, and you might have bones. Uh, that, you know the attacks are, are attacking the bones, and you might have different. Those vulnerabilities relate to exploitation and misuse cases. But the idea is that the attack tree is an exercise that is not a deliverable, but it's an exercise that you go through in order to say, how does? Let me walk through this. Let me try to understand how I'm going to attack my application. Now this is a pasta. Is ha 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 food related? you know, metaphor. So what, what do we have today for dining options for assessing web applications, just to be topical? Um, so we have today's state of mind. We have, you know, control gap analysis. You know, let me do my FISMA, let me do my ISO, let me do my PCI, my HIPAA, my high tech. You know, let me just do that gap analysis. And we're caught up doing that. And not to, not to say that that is bad. I'm not saying that's bad, but we're just caught up with that pragmatic approach. And, we're getting a false sense of like this is good stuff. We're doing good stuff, and at the end, it's not really it's not really healthy for the security organization or the organization overall. And then we have what I call the exploitation wine bars. Uh, so you have never been to a wine bar. You get good quality food, right? You got the cranberry pecan, you know, chicken salad with the blue cheese on top. Good stuff, um, but it, it's expensive. You know, you got the glass of Chianti. It's expensive. It might take a little bit more time to get served. It's more of an experience. But it's definitely, you know, you've got some, you got some good details when you're actually going through, um, you know, the pen testing. So what am I saying here? Am I saying that, you know, dynamic analysis and pen testing um, is basically, you know, old school and threat modeling is a new way, but I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that, well, first off, let me, before I get into pasta, let me just talk and say that, you know, there's multiple different ways to threat model an application. Uh, 
there is an asset-centric way, there is a software-centric way, there is, an as uh, there is a uh, security-centric way. But like I said before, um, PASTA stands for Process of Attack Simulation and Threat Analysis. We want to simulate the attacker in every which way, uh, shape, and form, but we have to understand our apps better. That's where we, as the white hats or the gray hats, are going to have the one-up advantage to the black hats who are on the outside because we can now understand the topology of our network, the uh, inherent controls across infrastructure devices, uh, uh, you know, application level controls and countermeasures. Um, this is a risk-based approach. I'll get into why that is because then at the end, we culminate and say, why, well, what are we trying to protect? We're trying to protect the asset's value. And so that's why it's a risk-based approach. This is sexy. This, this really establishes credibility if you guys want to kind of, as a security practitioner, you have to be a social engineering artist within your own organizations. You're talking to people who are suits, who have business mindsets, and you have to convey things that, that, that are of value to them. Why should you eat all this? I mean, if you don't believe in a risk-centric approach or an asset-centric approach, and you're more about software efficiency, uh, which is a software-centric approach, or you're more about just truest security, risk mitig uh, 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 attack mitigation, that's fine, but think of right now, um, right now the current testing solutions that are out there for testing applications really don't have, tell a full business story. There, if, you, if, you've, um, if you're in an application testing group, there's a lot of Chinese walls to your efforts to the rest of the business. So how do you convey, you know, um, the, the tester says basically here, I got to X because via ABC. The infrastructure manager says, well secure ABC. And he's like, just, just, just fix you know, how you got there. If this is how you got there, I want you to secure it. But the attacker says, I'd rather get into DEF. And so it's not a very holistic approach in terms of, I'm not saying that pen testing or static analysis is bad. Threat modeling actually is the wrapper for a lot of different security disciplines that are out there. So the question stands, do you know your threats? <clears throat> so imagine, for example, running along with the food analogy, imagine if you could have an all-you-could-eat of good quality food. And that's basically what the pasta methodology, or really threat modeling, tries to convey. Let me basically, you know, not only just understand that, you know, I have cross-site scripting issues on my web application, or I have basically, you know, poor parameterization in my app database, you know, on my web app, um, but it also allows you to go beyond that, understand motive, understand the actual uh, assets that are going to be, you know, affected, understand what the callers or actors are, and so it allows you to basically get a more intelligent view and landscape of your application from a security sense. This is positive. I'm not going to bore you and spend a lot of time on this. I would ask that you just read this, but I'm going to cover this right side of the... Um, right side of the, uh, the, this diagram here. When I say define objectives, automatically, as, as techno geeks that I'm sure most of you guys are, you're looking to basically say, hey, you know what? I don't really care about business objectives. Well, the ironic thing is, is that if you've been a developer and you've done you know, any sort of SDLC methodology, you have to get functional requirements that stem from business objectives. Why as security practitioners don't we do the same thing? A pen tester doesn't basically say, let me understand the business objectives of what I'm going to be doing in the next couple of hours. A static a source code analyzer doesn't do that either, or a social engineering artist. So for that reason, we want to understand uh, what the business objectives are. We want to define the technical scope. And I'm going to dissect this today. This is what this presentation is about. I'm going to dissect um, all of what goes on here at a high level so that we can uh, fit this all in. Stage one. Talking about business objectives, let's talk about the evil GRC. Everyone hates on GRC. If you don't know what it is, it's governance risk and compliance. It's got three antagonist po polarizing words right there in one ac acronym. Because most of the time, it's people that don't understand how to you know, carve up a tool, launch up a tool, just like Andy said this morning. And they're just basically throwing out rules that's based upon best practices or regulatory conditions. So, how, why would I even mention this? Isn't this sort of like application security heresy? Well, not necessarily, because there's a lot of good content. They develop policies for people governing actions, and there's standards that you know are kind of sparse in those organizations, but that are supposed to govern 
have hardening requirements for your Apache server, hardening requirements for your infrastructure devices. So there's a lot of inherent controls that can be built in. So prior to you basically doing a threat model, did you know that you can go through this threat modeling process and say, what do we got? What do we have to work with in terms of a governance? What are our, do we have existing risk assessments that define a risk profile? You're going to hear that term maybe in other circumstances, but a risk profile says, I'm going to build the new mobile app that's going to basically be, so there's a lot of talk about mobile payments. So how is that infrastructure, how is that client application going to look like? And so if we're in the business right now in the startup and doing that, Maybe there's some inherent risk that we have to basically address from the limitations of uh, hardware resources on the actual app and pro programmatic limitations, etc. So there's a risk profile that we can understand from the beginning. Regulatory landscape. Whether we like it or not, we're, you know, there's a lot of companies that are regulated. You know, utility, government, financial, healthcare, retail. So, I mean, we are doing the business a favor. We're getting some credibility as security professionals. If we bake this in, we get those auditors at bay and bake in their you know, requirements um, by having a baseline of uh, what sort of controls to bake in. If you're looking at PCI you know, and, and the requirement for certain processes to be in place, source code analysis or tools like web application firewalls, you bake that in into the design. You bake that in into the, your initial development efforts. Okay, so what's out there that you can use? The biggest problem is that all this requires, the G side requires content. The, the managing people and, and technology requires someone to write down who's intelligent, not just a tech writer, understands what you're trying to secure, and actually put forth some content. Luckily, okay, so I'm a bias at OWASP, I'm a chapter lead, I've been involved with organizations, phenomenal. It's got some cheat sheets, it's got some uh, development guides. So it's, it's, it has some things out of the box to basically say, let me leverage this content. Let me build it into my environment, tailor it that, for it works for me. Um, for example, here's an example of business objectives. So super cookies, very common from a market. If we're marketing people right now, we want to track everybody and their mother. We want to get where they've been, geolocation, everything. So super cookies or uh, you know, persistent cookies are great from a business standpoint. It's a little bit illegal according to the FTC, but nonetheless, a lot of companies are doing it. A lot of our clients are still doing it. And so, as security practitioners, we have to level set and say, okay, you want to do persistent cookies because you want to do tracking and get information so you can do other types of lists for your consumption consumers. This is where we level set stage one business objectives. Uh, easily accessible web services for internal APIs. Web services are escalating, proliferating a lot within the corporate environment. Here's the problem with web services. There's an implicit trust. Oh, I know the development group that wrote it. We trust their efforts. They don't have to do strong typing or signing uh, of the binaries or class objects. It, it's within our environment. We've got an internal firewall even. How about that? You know, the, we have to level set with the community because in security, we always say the given. The given is X, Y, Z might be a credential that's out in the clear. The given is that we have a rogue developer. Uh, there's a lot of givens that we can basically role play with. This last component here, overscoping. If you've ever been part of the, the definition phase of an SDLC life cycle, you might get over ambitious of business reps to say, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this. Oh, they have a roster of functional requirements. And then what happens is that you might have two of those functional requirements that we get use cases that are orphaned because they're not basically they're not in scope to the business objectives. So you have orphaned use cases. I'm sure you've maybe used different web apps, maybe LinkedIn, social networking things, or financial apps, where it's like they're less maintained use cases of that application. And the danger in that, when they're less maintained, you have old code that doesn't abide by those newer standards or best practices around validation and coding, etc. All right, so here's an artifact. I'm just gonna, I'm not going to talk about this. This is just simply, well, what type of output is produced here? This is a, this is a sample output. This is not something that you share with like, oh, I'm going to share this with my vendor or my uh, client organization that's asking about our security posture. No, this is this is like a working document for you when you're doing, assessing an application. Um, Merging business and security requirements. So on this side here, you have business requirements, and now you have security requirements. 
if one of the problems we have in security is that security is at the tail end of everything. We don't have our requirements at the inception of the design process. Now, I'm talking a lot about design and then requirements, so I'm obviously alluding to apps that are in development. How do you do something with a legacy app? How do we basically get the security compliance requirements into, into in, in, as part of a legacy app? It's difficult. It's going to have to be post-mortem. But when you have new iterations of legacy apps that are basically being rehashed, redone, then it's an opportune time for all of the things that I just mentioned in this space to be kicked in. All right, so this culminates uh, stage one. We're going to go to stage two. This basically, um, and hopefully you guys can see all this, but basically, you know, these are the kind of the main steps that happen. One of the things, and I'm a security guy, and I love technology, and I love to kind of work on tools more than anything, but if you want to be a dif differentiator as a security professional, get to know what the BA is, which is a legacy type security discipline, business impact analysis. That's something that has been around for years, but if you're able to manifest your web app testing in the, the business impact context, then you're going to be dangerous. You're going to be highly valued, and you're going to be able to transcend across both the technology and business lines. Let's go to stage two real quick. I'm going to do, uh, so stage two is technical scope. All this means is basically let's, let's take an inventory. You know, so we're cooking here, we're cooking some pasta. Let's take an inventory of what we got. So we're built, you know, from an architectural standpoint, let's look at our presentation layer, our client devices, <coughs> let's look at our internet web server, or what type of internet web server we're we running, Apache, what version are we running, you know, .NET, you know, do we have a memcache server, do we have our F5 load balancers here, and a memcache server, you know, so that it's basically caching a lot of requests, you know, statically, and, and on the Linux platform. Um, and then going to an Apache, and then going down the LAMP stack to, you know, maybe uh, further down into like a cluster MySQL environment um, with some Java mixed in here. But we want to understand the nuts and bolts, what platform level, what databases are we doing DB2. We want to understand the nuts and bolts here uh, across all of the traditional, you know, multi-layered architecture. And this is what you don't get with pen testing or static analysis. And I'm not, again, criticizing that. It's just a different beast, but it's, this is the wrapper. We finally have a chance to back up and say, what do we really have in this environment? Let me understand it better so I can decompose it better. All right, so by defining the, the, uh, the technical scope, we basically understand the network topology a lot better. There might be that your, your network topology might suck. You might have just, you know, allow any, any, everywhere, every protocol, all the time. Um, well, that's, now you know. Now you know. There's always a presumption that certain mitigation exists. Um, remember the, the, the comment I said that the attacker is looking to get in DEF. The test had already tested for ABC. The manager is saying, secure ABC. So we want to look at everything that was, was right here so that we can basically understand protocols and services in use, use case scenarios you know, externally coming in and then within the environment. Um, and so you want to model the application and understand security architectural risks. So going back to the SDLC use case, now when we get into the design mode, we can talk to the network you know, uh, architects and say, you know what, your design is off. Your design is off because you don't have enough continuity controls you know, in your network topology. Your application doesn't have enough continuity uh, because it's, not, it's, it's uh, basically written in C, so it's more susceptible to different types of overflow-based attacks. So we're now able to talk to different people, not just you know, the information owner, application owner with a remediation roster, Excel spreadsheet, and walk away. We're now more intelligent as security professionals. So at the end of this stage, what do we got? We basically have an understanding of the standards that could have been put in place, may have been put in place at stage one. We understand the business objectives. We limit the scope. We understand what's underneath the hood. We understand maybe third-party application dependencies that are in the mix, uh, not excluding them from our testing um, methodology and scope. So we have more of a kind of a, a, a you know su substance of uh, application testing. Stage three, let's break down the application. Now let's put away IT, let's put away business ops, and let's um, let's let's get more into the destructive mode of mindset, which is what 
we are naturally born to do. So stage three, we're going to identify the application controls, and we're going to dissect. We're going to dissect. You know, who are the actors in our application? You know, this means application users. So you know, those those credentials that are stored in web.config or in an INI file or you know, uh, part of the batch script. You know, those in, in the context of the pro in the PID of the platform that's run as root or run as an elevated a system uh, process. That's an actor. When you when you run the Microsoft tool set that they have from the ACE team, the TAM tool, um, that they basically help you define actors as a network service, a system service, a user, uh, an application user. So what, where are the actors at? Now we want to understand what calls do they make. You know, what explicit calls has the so software developer, has the security architect, have they envision for what they're, how they're going to interrupt, how they're going to basically interoperate between the different layers of the application. This is a key aspect of the phase. No other security discipline breaks down your application. And um, to the way that now we're kind of like in a, in a constructive way understanding it. We're going to enumerate all of our use cases, which is going to be helpful if we do, if we do an attack trick. We're going to enumerate our use cases so we can map. We're going to have some examples of that uh, as part of this presentation. ID data sources. This is a DFD diagram. This is one of the exercises that you do with application threat modeling. Again, a very traditional, this is kind of outdated really, because you got to use a browser, forget about that. You've got, you got, you got the plugin stack to worry about. You have a, a browser stack that has you know, different you know, JavaScript, DHTML, HTML5. Then before that, you've got like, plugins now that are writing on top of that. So you've got like, Flex and Flash and, and Silverlight and Ajax. That's, they got their own stack. So there's like something right here. You've got to understand calls between that stack, the browser. Obviously, you can't do much here unless you're basically writing the actual, you know, Ajax uh, calls and you know, um, making like plugins for your clients or your users. But the point is, we want to understand the protocols, the types of calls, posts, get any type of requests going to your web servers. Um, this is a very simple single point of failure, obviously. These sort of designations too, this is static, the, the, kind of the bars, all these things mean something. Um, you can get a lot of this good information um, on the Microsoft side, but basically you want to identify where your static data rest is. You want to understand what sort of like uh, APIs, is this basically an XML, is this an uh, XML RPC call? So you're using RPC calls here, are you using SAML, are you using SOAP? You know, what are you using? Are you doing in behind your own internal app layer? Are you doing SSL? You might not be doing SSL. So you got to be able to understand, is that an issue right here? Is that an issue that I don't do SSL? Um, you want to also look at, when I talk about use cases, this just popped in my head, what about administration? What about the attack vector or the attack surface of the administrator? So somebody's got to maintain all this, the sysadmins, right? What about you know them using like Telnet, SSH, RDP, PC anywhere, whatever, whatever they got? We want to understand those use cases as well. So, transactional security control analysis, analysis as we break down the application. This says these are the transactions that I'm doing. This is a, another artifact. This is not for the you know the auditors or whatever. This is for your eyes only. You want to understand what risks based upon maybe the risk profile that we talked about earlier or you maybe designate some here. Data classification is important, that's going to weigh into that. And then you have all the types of different security things that you should you know, be looking to develop if they're not in place. Session management, you know, properly terminating sessions on web applications, uh, error handling, not divulging too many information about what goes wrong in an application. So this is an artifact, and this is kind of like the stage three wrap up here. Stage four is going to be the threat analysis. Now, this is where now we cross over. And these next two stages are going to be things that we're going to port, honestly, from the strengths of security operations. Because security operations, um, you know, we got uh, Dell SecureWorks in here. They, they do threat uh, intel uh, uh, feeds uh, like Sophos and like other companies do. 
Um, so threat intel, threat gathering, that's a SOC function. You got, and obviously, you got your own testing, you got your, maybe your existing infrastructure is capturing alerts in the SIEM solution. Um, but the point is here is that we're not going to reinvent the wheel as threat modeling you know, experts. We're going to basically port it, you know, port leverage that expertise. We need to enumerate what threats are going to affect our application environments. And this is going to come, this is basically chops up to threat intelligence. How do we get there? Prior assessments, other assessments, third party assessments, threat intel, threat feeds. That's what I'm talking about. How do, that's a lot of data. And you know, there's tools out there to kind of aggregate, correlate, you know, and based upon certain criteria, weigh that, that, that sort of data so that you can identify you know, these different types of uh, PII threats that are based upon these attacks, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, man in the middle. Um, you also have uh, you know, any of these types of attacks as well. So the threat is basically saying what could happen? Could, are we concerned about data loss? Are we concerned about being a part of the botnet, like the financial institutions are having a huge challenge in responding to? You know, what, how, what is the threat for your app, for your, your organization? This is stuff that you're going to get based upon um, talking to your uh, monitoring groups. And you get this intelligence through, um, for example, do you have an IDS IPS? Do you have firewalls? Who's monitoring them? Are you looking at the intel, the wealth of information that's there? Are you trending attacks? Because if you are, then you might say that you're getting kind of like some weird header requests to your web app or some you know, kind of weird malformed um, you know, uh, post requests to your web app. Uh, or you might be getting you know, even like you know, different types of attacks related to war dialing. Someone's trying to hit, when I do social engineering, I, I hit the phone system. I want to get the intel on people's machines. And a lot of people don't reset their phone passwords. And if I understand that they have an Avaya or if they have a different type of phone system, I'm going to just do some simple homework and be able to get in 0000, 0, 0, 0 1, 2, 3, 4, down the middle, whatever the case may be. But the point is, what are your threats? Do you understand? If you, you, some of the threats are inherent to industry. Some of the threats are inherent to the actual platform. Uh, for example, here I gave the example of you know, content management systems, Joomla, Zoop, Mambo, uh, Mambo, etc. But going back to the context of the, 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 the uh, S, you know, threat modeling for the SDLC, we have an opportune time during the SDLC process to say, we understand our threats because as a threat modeler, we've gone to the SOC. We, and we've basically gotten this intel that over the past year, we've been getting a lot of weird you know, uh, net BIOS queries or you know, DNS queries you know, to our external, or even within our environment, internal DNS queries or you know, uh, different probes to file systems that look a little bit weird. Um, so we want to be able to understand that and get that intelligence. Now, all of that has to be automated because there's no way, shape, and form, if you ever worked in a dungeon in a SOC, there's no way a human can process all of that information. There's also external uh, solutions like VeriSign's um, uh, incident. Um, you know, you can submit incidents on the various net network and, and get a, 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 kind of like a trend of what's the hottest incidents that are happening right now for different types of protocols. If you ever use the website Shodan or Shodan, um, that basically allows you to see kind of like what are the most popular open discovered services that are out there globally, and they're, they're doing a very good job. That's the type of threat intelligence that, as a threat modeler, that you want to be able to understand. You know, uh, common exploits. Um, around access control, around web-based technologies, etc. So, fortunately, you know, content. I, I could give a separate talk on just content. Security content is a huge problem. And we gave a uh, asylum from Symantec, the CEO at RSA. He said, "Our the future is going to be interoperability of data. There's so much data out there. How do we work? Make it all work? So you, you know about the CVEs." Um, you know about the, uh, now MITRE has the CWEs for weakness and enumeration, OWASP has different lists, SANS has different lists. We want to be able to understand how this library can be managed. Fortunately, this, this library of, of different um, uh, weaknesses and enumeration or attacks with KPEG and MITRE, they're contained more and more and more with the tool sets that we buy. So we don't have to basically worry about different rosters of like what types of buffer overflow are out there. 
You know, what are the variants? What heap, buffer, um, you know, logic bomb expressions do I have to worry about for my web application? Like I said, OWASP has a lot of this content. Depending upon your application, you need to take a look and see what sort of threats am I most likely going to face, and from that, define attacks that you want to test against. It's going to make you a better tester, a better security practitioner. So this is the walk. This is the stage four walkthrough. This was threat intel gathering. We're almost there, guys. We just got three more. And stage five is weakness and vulnerability analysis. This is going to be the easiest step because this is vulnerability detection, weakness enumeration. We got all the tools in the world. I don't care if you're Nextbooth or Nessus or you know, uh, whatever you use, Saint. Um, but you, you, this is where we as threat modelers, we don't, we basically extend an olive branch to the SOC, to the security vulnerability the detection, and say, I need your help. There's nothing, I mean, you're talking about just a human uh, aspect of our, of our psyche. There's nothing, you know, better than just like, uh, you know, the, the keynote today, when Andy said, you go to up to someone, shake their hand. When you go as a security practitioner and say, I need your help, I can't, I can't understand the vulnerability of my app unless I get your help. So by including the, the you know, this is an example of like, there's people already testing the application and the network. So we don't want to basically get in their way and say, I don't know how to do this better. I want to be able to identify the vulnerabilities better. We want to leverage that work. We want to leverage that work. They have their swim lane, but we want to leverage this so that we can integrate it into our attack tree. So it, it's threat modeling, you know, taking a step back, security is very adversarial to our cus internal customers. Threat modeling has a way of basically being less adversarial, more collaborative. collaborative. So this really should have been in the last slide, but this basically is modern CWEs, and you have a roster of different things that they have. The build list is ever really growing. What I wanted to say about MITRE is that they also have attack vignettes. Attack vignettes are just simply like, let's make attack scenarios for healthcare. Let's make attack scenarios for uh, retail. So that helps you out because it's like, well, why are they making these attack vignettes? Because they're talking to all these different players in these industries. They're saying, yeah, I got, you know, we got, we got an incident, you know, where, you know, this happened on our uh, um, healthcare app, you know, uh, within, the, within the organization. Um, or this happened within accounts payable within the healthcare department. Um, and so they're seeing a lot of things. They're responding to that by creating these attack scenarios that give everyone the you know, ability to understand what are the common threat scenarios that you know, certain different types of industries face. So I didn't spend a lot of time on five because we've all seen it, we've all done it. I mean, vulnerability detection, you know, port mapping, uh, reconnaissance and social engineering, you know, whatever, wherever you find the holes and kind of identifying those holes um, so that you can map those vulnerabilities to assets, going back to the taxonomy of terms that we had earlier, mapping them to the assets that we've identified during the application um, decomposition and the technical scope phase, and then marrying the vulnerabilities to, to, uh, to the attacks, which is the next phase. We want to now attack the application. We understand it much better than any security discipline that is currently in practice today. Um, if you're doing source, let's talk about source code analysis. If you're doing source code analysis, you still go through that regimen of like, I did my manual and I did my automated. My automated found 38,000 vulnerabilities, and my manual found 150, but they're spot on. So the response from that is never like, what's the business impact? Typically it's like, fix it, fix it. It's, 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 and it's common and with the 38,000, it's like one bird kills multiple stone, a bird, one stone kills multiple birds. Um, and, uh, but the point here is that you don't go through the sort of like, you know, uh, att attack planning that you go through with, with, with uh, threat modeling. Whether it be, you know, with pasta as, as the, the methodology or anything else. Well, let's go through this attack tree. So, we got a fraudster, and he can basically go through different types of, you know, different attack factors here. You know, uh, we're looking at attack surface, so here's, here's, here's one. The end goal is to basically steal something. So the attack surface here is a site. Here is a different attack surface. It's a little bit smaller. It's the browser, the victim using the site. This is the client entity, the business running the site. And here you have, again, just attacking the user. Um, 
through you know different uh, social engineering techniques. Um, so you get to kind of think beyond you know I, I know that for example you know a lot of uh, more renowned ex expert social engineering artists there's there's nothing that's off the table. When you want to get to somebody, you do it by any means necessary. Phone, logical network, you know, their, their personal uh, account, whatever, so that you can connect the dots. I think, um, but the, the point is, is that you want to go through this exercise so you can kind of understand and see what likely attack scenarios are going to be possible. Here is one attack model. So this is, again, a data flow diagram. This is basically looking to exploit cross-site scripting vulnerability on an inter in internal network device. Here is the security administrator, okay? He's an unsuspecting guy. He's like, I'm not on the target. I'm inside, I'm inside the network. I'm inside this, this area. So I'm not going to get fed a cross-site scripting link. I've run into so many different internal uh, uh, attackers. Well, I haven't run into them, but I've identified them. Um, where they're feeding, they're basically colluding and feeding you know, um, uh, attacks, whether it be you know, human exploits or something like a malicious link, to, 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 to an attacker. So here's a, a scenario where you want to understand, could this possibly happen to you? If, if basically you're like Unisys, not to call it Unisys, but you know, a lot of these like uh, Booz Allen, um, a lot of these organizations in the federal government, you're managing a lot of shared infrastructure. Well, if I'm, a, if I'm an attacker, I'm, you're, you're attracted to me because you're managing a lot of crap. So this scenario right here is very appealing to me as an attacker. It's not going to be appealing as the tester who is basically thinking about NIST 853 or you know, um, you know, any sort of like a benchmark analysis. We whistle through here, another artifact. You have different types of attacks. You have different types of, um, different types. This is, this is more from a banking context. But you have, this is an idea in terms of like the banking and FIs, they have to basically address, and this is a huge problem for them. So this is another example where you're attack modeling. And ultimately what happens at the end of this is that you're using your pen testing tools, your, your Metasploit, your Armitage, your Watobo, your WebPD, your, you know, whatever you use, SQL Mapper, whatever. You're using this to basically say, okay, I want to do this, that, these abuse cases against these use cases and I'm going to test them with these tools. And you're not doing it as a threat modeler, now you're talking to, you're extending, the, you're, you're extending the invitation to your pen testers and say, this is what I'm worried about. Can you focus on this as part of your repertoire? And they're doing their thing, but they're now getting a different you know, understanding of how, how different attacks. And then from that, now we're going to get to the final stage, is that we have these mitigations. So these brute force, that's supposed to say brute, brute force attacks for user authentication, you, you, you know, you can have like countermeasures in your applications that you know are simple that you do introduce at various level. But now you start thinking about countermeasure development. It's not just remediation. It's countermeasure development within your infrastructure, within your application. So stage six is that. Stage seven is going to be now. Now this is where it all culminates with pasta. It's about understanding that in security, you're not going to fix everything. You're not. So how do you spend the company's money to fix the right things based upon a true understanding of threats and likely attack vectors? So you are now saying, instead of basically fixing everything because of a control framework, we understand these to be true based upon our intel that we have from our threat intelligence, from our internal you know, uh, monitoring uh, alerts and, and so forth that have been trended. And so we're developing countermeasures that are actually you know, going to be more uh, specific and a better investment for the organization. You've got multiple things here. Uh, you've got uh, cross-site scripting. You've got some directory file traversal. You've got SQL injection. You've got, um, you got the, uh, uh, platform level command invocation. Uh, and you've got basically at ele ele elevation of privileges trying to do uh, basically the orange, which is the bad, and then now we're understanding what countermeasures to develop, not just in our web server, but across the different trust boundaries that we have. You know, we do not trust across these trust boundaries. Maybe we don't even trust within here. So this is the type of knowledge that we get from doing application threat modeling. And typically, it all happens not on a sheet of paper or a report, but it all happens right here with your dev, with your dev team. So just to end, basically, the risk definition that's always been alive and well is that 
threats times vulnerabilities times, times impact. Some people just even leave out the impact. Uh, I say that's wrong. Threat times vulnerability times impact times probability. I say that's still not good enough. I, I prefer, so our risk is residual risk, because that's what you're really trying to, uh, to basically get to. What is left over? What's the, the clean at the bottom? Um, so the residual risk is you have impact of something bad can happen. What is the probability of a threat occurring? What is the probability of a vulnerability being discovered by the attacker? And then you have like divided by countermeasures. You have inherent countermeasures that we can find in stage one. There might be process or technology-based controls. But you're having to factor that in, so you don't go to the, to the business and say, invest in my paranoia without me having considered what we actually have underneath the hood. So this is going to be a more intelligent recommendation to you know, the business owners, information owners, etc. You're, when, when we're, as a threat modeler, when you're in bed with the pen test or with the source code analyst, now we're substantiating P. P is always like a touchy-feely number. What's the probability? How do I know? I mean, it's, you know, how do I, how do I determine if this is going to happen tomorrow or next month? I don't know. Well, that's determined based upon the effectiveness of our testing. If we can test it under a more confined time frame, because we always have somebody with it on our backs saying, hurry up, you got to do the next one versus the hackers that have all the time in the world and a team to do it, then you know, we have to raise the P coefficient there on this formula. So it elevates the, the basically the value in the analysis. Um, and we're considering, you know, again, inherent countermeasures and countermeasures to be developed. And so the Goldilocks metaphor there, or analogy, is simply that we're finding the perfect blend of countermeasures to develop. It's not just let me get the wall, the, the, the SAMs or the Costco bag of like, you know, countermeasures and let me dump it on the organization. Because that's just not effective and it's not working. So tools along the way rapidly. This is Isograph. It's a commercial company. They do threat intelligence, threat modeling for like major government science. This, this is more scientific. It's got some weird uh, mathematical calculations. They're out of California, great company. Uh, obviously, you've got TAM, Microsoft. You've got a lot of the terminologies, components, uh, data. All, the, all these are really assets. Use cases, you have your threats. Uh, the, the SDL IT version is basically is, is, uh, free but requires Visio. That's more of a software-centric one. Here's another one. Uh, this is the SDL IT one. And if you've heard of threat model, you've probably heard of Stride. You've probably heard of Dread. Stride is just not a methodology. It's actually a security classification. I'm going to get a spoofing attack, a tampering of data attack, a you know, denial of service attack. Dread is also by Microsoft and says, what is the re it's, it's an acronym for impact. So they do a good job of doing security centric and somewhat degree like asset centric. So they are like, what are the reproducibility of this vulnerability? What is the likelihood of exploitation, et cetera? That's what Dread's about. But this is all about security efficiencies. If you're interested more in that, I'm actually working with an OWASP project. I've come up with a straw man on a software-centric approach with people from Sigital and other organizations. So that's, look out for a software-centric approach if you're not feeling the risk uh, issue. This is a threat only tool called, um, from a company called My App Security. Um, and basically, this is more, this is, this is as easy as you get with threat modeling. You got very, like, you know, easy to identify caricatures or icons here. You just drag and drop, and they have behind each one of these login events a library of different use cases. So you can basically like double click on here, and you're going to get you know what type of authentication countermeasures maybe you should have, uh, what type of abuse cases are typically seen over these different types of channels. Okay, so benefits really quick: extending the knowledge branch across the board to business, to IT, to developers. People are now starting to get it um, and understand what we as security uh, professionals have been uh, talked about. You know, it's basically understanding the things that the other disciplines don't have is we, under, we break down our application. We understand business impact. We build in uh, governance. I mean, that's a huge win. Then talk about training. Naturally, as we go through this process and everyone who goes with it, they're naturally being trained. They're just naturally being trained because they're seeing, okay, soup to nuts, this is what I should be worried about. And developers, and it's more collaborative versus me going to the developer and saying, here you go, here's your remediation list. I ran the tool, I don't really know what the hell I'm doing, and I'm going to leave. 
And that's what's happening today, but instead, we're working with developers to say, you know what, our threat model, we found that these five scenarios are pretty likely to happen based upon threat intel. Let's test these guys, and I found that they're true. The testers have a better knowledge of what they're doing, and the developers have a more understanding of the impact. Follow me on Twitter if you want. I'm at Versprite, um, or you can send me an email, TonyUV at Versprite, or TonyUV at OWASP. So hopefully this was good, and I really appreciate your time today. Any questions? So I was a little bit over. I think I. So is this a tool or a process? What, yeah, it's, 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 right? it's a process. Actually, you know, so I've really, really not seen anything new here. I mean, this is stuff we do all the time. Well, yeah, it, 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 it seems uh, very kind of app or app focus. Is that the intent? Rather than looking at the business as your attack. Well, it's looking at everything. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about. So what attackers are doing now, what we're seeing is. They're really, yeah, you're actually being they're attacking your people. Yeah, that, that's why this is here. That's just why this is here. I mean, I just kind of went over it. I mean, you are looking at your human targets as well. I mean, you can't. I, have, I gave the example about threat modeling, like, you know, the Finnish constitution of Finland, how that they're using the threat modeling. So, I don't think that's what you're all the cool things you said. Well, that, that's, that, that's, that's, that's what threat modeling encompasses. It goes beyond, and I talked about several use cases where network-based attacks, apps attacks, clients, attacks. I mean, there's all sorts of desires there. Because that's the media side, so that's obviously interacting with the human on a personal level. Yeah, so when I see that, I can watch about it. That's a use case example. Well, there's a threat on a parallel level that can also be applied to legacy apps, or legacy environments, or legacy that's true. Like I said, threat modeling the right military operations. We're looking at usually ballistic missile uh, operations. Like, I'm going to do this. Okay. 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 I want to go. Thanks. Jeff, did you get for lunch? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.